Okay, so we are going to continue today with the um, discussion about geometric transformations. So the main task was that we have an input image, we have a given transformation, and we would like to transform the image under this geometric transformation. This can be, for example, scaling up or down the image, could be a shift, could be a rotation of the image. So these types of geometric operations. And this is needed for a number of different tasks. One of the, or three main applications uh, just mentioned last, uh, in the last lecture. The first one is, is rectification, where we have an input image, potentially distorted input image, and we want to undistort or rectify this image according to some information about the geometry of the scene that we have. And we had this example of this aerial image that I, that I want to rectify according to the um, ground surface or the surface of the earth here in this image. So this was the mapping from the distorted image to a rectified image. We can also use the other way around, use an input and rectified image and want to distort or warp this image onto a 3D structure. And this is very frequently used in any type of rendering. So if you want to render a scene, you typically have a texture and you have to wrap texture, for example, a part of the dinosaur onto the geometric model. And this is then used to generate um, photorealistic images or renderings of scenes. The same actually holds for a 3D reconstruction. So if you do a 3D reconstruction of a scene with a camera and you want to give the user afterwards um, a realistic impression of the scene, we also need to store the texture information that we see from our camera images and then wrap that on the geometric surface given the new kind of virtual viewpoint of the camera that is used for rendering. So it's nothing which only happens kind of in computer graphics, but it's also something that we need in order to generate photorealistic reconstructions of the environment that contain texture. And last but not least, we had the application of alignment or registration of images. So we have two um, non-rectified images and we want to overlay them, for example, to do a morphing one from one face into another face. Today I will just also show a small application where this technique can be used. So we said we have two images. We start with an image A and an image B. B was our input image. A was the desired output image. And we were describing everything via transform. So this was, uh, we read this as a transform from B, so the input image, to the output image A. So this transforms a coordinate. So this is not an intensity value. So this is a coordinate of a pixel for which we have an intensity value into a new location of that pixel. And the problem that we identified was that if we do this mapping, we may obtain coordinates for our new pixel locations or intensity values. We map those intensity values from integer pixel locations in X into um, a non-integer value in Y that we need to do an interpolation um, for our image. So we looked into three different types of interpolation techniques. One was simply a nearest neighbor interpolation, the second one was bilinear interpolation, and the third one was bicubic interpolation. And the idea was is that we have a known intensity value on a grid-like structure. So this are, these are all those points over here. So for those points, we have an intensity or here a color value for illustration. So we know that this one is yellow, we know this one is blue, we know this one is cyan, this one is red. And the question is, what is the color of all the pixels in between? So it means we have a, a grid, regular grid structure in this case with known intensity values or known color values and how should those color values in between look like. With the nearest neighbor assignment we end up having something like this over here, we can actually zoom that up. So every, every pixel which is closest to this one will get the color cyan in this case. Same holds for red, yellow, blue over here. And this is obviously not a very smooth and very realistic image of the world. So the, the thing which we can do next is we say, okay, we take a bilinear interpolation. And in this case, for any pixel in between, we are looking to the four neighbors and then doing interpolation in X as well as an interpolation in Y in order to obtain the corresponding um, color value. And we get a result like this. We can even improve this by um, not doing linear interpolation, but um, using a polynomial of the order of three to do this interpolation, then taking into account more than those four neighbors. And then we ended up with the bicubic interpolation, and this is a, a kind of 
high quality interpolation technique in order to obtain a good estimate in most cases of the color in this image. This is kind of where we stopped last, in the last lecture, and then we looked into the, te into the forward or inverse sampling technique. And that's, where, that's basically where we stopped. So the question is, how do I now finally compute my output image? So I have my input image. I want to transform this into my output image. And the forward warping technique worked in that way that, is, that we said, for all pixels in my input image, so for all pixels in B, so this reads as for all, so go for every pixel location over here, compute the transformation, and map it to the new space. So okay, let's, let's say those black circles over here are now places for which we have an input intensity value. So for all those circles, we know the input intensity value. So we transform it through our mapping TBA, and then those points end up somewhere like this. So this is just kind of more or less random just, just for an illustration. So we know, we know now, given this transformation, the intensity values of those black spots. At those black spots, we know the intensity values of the transformed image. The problem that we have, that we also in our output image have a regular grid structure, so we want to know those values here at those locations. So kind of these blue circles are those intensity values, those locations for which we would like to know the intensity values but we only have them for the black ones. So in this forward warping technique, where I say for every pixel in the input image, compute the intensity value in the output image. This is kind of the step in this direction. It actually can happen, like in was one example where this was the case, where like this one, this area over here, actually none of the black places actually ends up in this region. So depending on the transformation that I have, um, I may have areas for which I don't have any information in this direction. So what we're basically doing here, we are reconstructing the intensity at the blue locations. So those are the intensities that I want to have. I'm reconstructing those on the regular grid, on the regular pixel grid structure of my output image, given the black ones, which are kind of irregularly distributed over the image, assuming that I have whatever, some kind of nonlinear weird transformation in here. So this is a forward technique. The backward technique works the other way around. So I start with my output image and then say, okay, for every pixel location in the output image, so I'm iterating over the pixel locations in the output, not those in the input image. So I'm starting from the output and say, I want to have the intensity values at those blue locations. Okay, what do I do? I transform the blue ones into my input image, so from the output image into the input image. So the inverse of the transform. So A and B are swapped compared to the previous slide. If I do that, they may end up in space somewhere like this. OK, again, I have the problem. I want to know where the blue ones are, which are now the ir irregular ones in the input image but I only know that for those black locations, so on this grid structure. So my task is now slightly the other way around. I still want to reconstruct the intensity values at the blue locations, but this is now the irregular, or not grid, irregular structure, given the black ones, which is a regular grid structure. And what I do here now is I can now directly use my linear or bicubic interpolation by saying I know the locations at the black spot, so I have this known regular structure, and for the blue ones, I want to reconstruct it. So in this case, for example, for this locations, I, location, I do the, for example, bilinear interpolation from those four neighbors. It's a standard technique. And then I can compute this intensity value, and I then know that this intensity value is, for example, corresponded to this one, because I basically store, or I know that this one was actually mapped here, so I reconstruct this location. And this pixel will be colored in the color resulting from those four neighbors. Okay? It's kind of the idea of this forward technique and this inverse warping technique, kind of better explained. Okay, so again, the inverse warping goes from A to B, whereas the forward technique goes from B to A and 
Going from B to A is the same offer, effort, but it's clearly suboptimal. So what we want to do is we want to go from A to B. So this is the inverse technique that I'm using. And I'm typically, it's not suggested to use a forward technique. So on your current homework exercise sheets, you should actually be able to do this transformation and see also which effects can happen if we use this forward transformation. For example, that we have mis missing pixels in our um, output image because we don't have any pixel from our input image which is mapped in the local neighborhood of this pixel. If you, on the other uh, hand, do it the other way around, so we start from the output image, um, we don't suffer from this problem. So this is the technique that you want to use, the inverse warping technique. Okay? So a few more examples of what you can actually do using these warping techniques. So one of the things is, for example, we have to, can have two faces, so we can have a face, and then say, okay, we have certain locations which we, for example, can manually label in those images and say, okay, this location should actually be moved here and this location should be moved over here. Based on this, I can actually compute a transformation and this, and this transformation is kind of how a regular grid would be transformed. So the pixel coordinate from here shifted in this direction, the pixel coordinate, the grid which was originally here shifted in this direction. So this kind of grid shows the deformation of the image that I'm actually doing. And if I do that, I can actually turn that person into a laughing person, at least up to some degree. The same technique is also used if you want to do, for example, um, more complex warping techniques. So we want to warp two faces or a person onto an animal. Um, we could have this face over here, so this is the original image, and this is what a direct overlay of those images would result into. What I can, however, do I can actually transform this image, or transform both images, into kind of the by marking, for example, the locations of the eye, the location of the nose, of the mouse, and kind of interpolate between them, so they kind of meet in the middle, and then I can actually do the warping uses, for example, for videos where the face of one person um, warps into or blends into uh, the other person. So this would be the result of a proper warping. This is the result of just an overlay. It's kind of one interesting application or kind of nice application that you can do with that. It's actually work done by a couple of um, psychologists and um, people from biology, which simply took faces of people, taking pictures under controlled environments, so every person was kind of more or less in the same setting, and then they manually marked around 250 locations in, in all of those images, and those define the warping between those images. So you basically get those, those kind of warping masks. So these are all the points that needed to be labeled in all the different images. And then we can transform the images according to this, to this mask and overlay multiple of images and actually get something which is an average face. If you can do that, you actually take, in this case, I think 45, uh, 64 female and 32 male people, you can actually turn them into an average face. And these are kind of two average faces of um, Germans which were warped or which were, which were averaged with such a warping technique. And so the people from psychology and biology were more interested in kind of what's the perception of beauty. And because if you overlay those images, you may argue that these persons look actually quite, are quite beautiful. So, and this is one of the, was used for one of those um, uh, hypotheses and how we perceive beauty and that kind of averaging is actually something which is often perceived um, as beautiful. And so some of the things he, which resulted from this is actually, so the more beautiful faces or what people perceived as beautiful were in those input images, so kind of in, in those images, also the more beautiful the outcome would be. This is probably a result which may not be too surprising. But another surprising result was actually the more people were averaged, the more beautiful the person actually appeared. So kind of the more average, the closer we, we come to the average, the more beautiful um, this is. And this effect is actually stronger for male faces than for female faces. So uh, males are kind of more average or it's perceived as more beautiful if they are more average. There's more variation in females. These are some of those results. And the people actually then um, ask all of the, um, or created a virtual Miss Germany by looking into the, um, actually, persons selected from the individual local countries of Germany, illuminated them under standard conditions, and actually then created the virtual Miss Germany. And then actually the result was this person over here, and this was the actual Miss Germany. And according to all the, res all the uh, ratings they actually got, 
the virtual Miss Germany was actually perceived as more beautiful than, than the real one. And um, they actually used this to derive a formula how people see, perceive beauty. And this is one of the results. So kind of deriving a beauty formula and then actually generated artificial faces which are kind of optimized under this objective function of beautiness. And this was actually two of those results. You can actually go to this website and actually um, get, get much more background information about this. This was, from my point of view, um, a kind of nice application, and therefore I presented it here, of those warping techniques. So of course it's diff difficult in this case, or one of the efforts in here is to find this transformation on how to compute this average face. And this was done basically using 250 control points that need to be clicked in every of those images, but then I can actually do these warping techniques um, in order to come to those results and then do further studies based on these things. And of course, this is just kind of one application example where those warping techniques are used. There are, of course, a lot of other techniques, but this was kind of something which is a bit uncommon and therefore um, worth actually presenting it here. So is there any questions so far about this warping technique and these ideas of whatever forward warping, backward warping, about interpolation or something we discussed so far or discussed um, last week? Okay, so, yeah. The outcome picture was always the picture A, right? The outcome was always the picture A, yes. So in all these, so I've redone those drawings now to avoid the confusion that we had last time. So B was always the input and A was always the output image. Exactly, and here was a mapping just the other way around, coming from A, going to B, but this was actually the inverted mapping and therefore we start from A and go to B, but B was our input image and A was our output image. And therefore, I kind of have redone this figure compared to the, the errors we had before in those slides. I used kind of these black and the blue um, circles in, in order to kind of make this difference between having, being on the regular structure or being on the irregular structure uh, more kind of intuitive. So what you actually do here, you just actually pick out the color you want to do in the regular grid on, on, uh, on grid A, and you pick out the color from somewhere in between the grid of uh, the input to the grid B. Not somewhere in between. So the first part was absolutely right. So um, I start with one location over here and was what the transformation of this position tells me is where am I located in my input image? So that's and somewhere in between. It's typically somewhere in between, and yes. There I pick out the color which I will place on A. Exactly. I look into the neighbors on the regular grid structure. So if I do bilinear interpolation, I would take those four. If I do bicubic interpolation, I would take those 16 values. And then use those 16 values to actually compute the intensity value for this location. And this intensity value is then written here. So any further questions about that? OK. Um, OK, then we are starting over here looking into um, or one special kind of transformation which is often used. So what should I do if the image is too big to display it? So for example, in this case, I have an image which is larger than something that fits on that slide. And how, sh how should I reduce? this image in order to obtain um, an image that actually kind of fits on my slide or if we kind of want to scale an image. So let's say we want to reduce the size of an image by a factor of two. So we actually should be able to do that. So if you have our transformation, um, transformation matrix plus a shift, so two by two matrix, um, how would that actually look like. So okay, here's our kind of the coordinates should go here. So this was x, b, y, b, and I want to end up x, a, um, y, a. So if I want to shrink the size of the image by a factor of two, do I need to shift the image? So just want to reduce its size, is there a need for a shift? No. Okay. 
So those guys should be zero, zero, because there's no shift involved. What about those four values that go into my transformation in here? Do I need off-diagonal elements for that? No, because I don't want to do any shear. So these are zeros. What goes on the main diagonal? So kind of the pixel location, let's say, at 4-4 four, four should be mapped on 2-2. Two, two. What was on 2-2 two, two should be mapped on 1-1. One, one. So which factor should go in here? Yeah, half and half. So if I apply this transformation, then I scale down my image by a factor of two. So what happens in this case? So we said we have a pixel from the location, let's say 2, 2, is actually mapped to 1, 1. Right? Okay, that's all fine. Then we take a pixel location at 4, 4, and this is mapped to 2, 2. So let's say if I look to the diagonal of my image, this will be the first, the ne the first pixel in the image, and this will be the second pixel on the Im in the image. What about 3, 3? What happens with pixel 3.3? Three, three? So 1.5, 1.5, so that's true. Will this have any impact? This, exactly, this information is completely ignored. Because 4.4 four is mapped on 2.2, two, 2.2 two, two, two is mapped on 1.1, one, one, so there's nothing I need to interpolate in between. So kind of the information from this pixel is completely lost. We can ask ourselves, this is a good idea if we, if we lose information. If we throw away something, it's often not a very good idea. But I can do that. So if I apply this transformation, so this would be the forward transformation, this would be the inverse transformation, then I can actually generate half size version of the image. So this is the original image in half of its size, a quarter of its size, and an eighth of its size. So just applying this transformation multiple times. So I hope you can actually see that on the projector only partially. So you have certain effects that actually occur, and these are basically aliasing effects, because what you're basically doing in every image, you throw away 50% of, of the rows and 50% of the columns of the image. You throw away going from one step to the other step. So what, what, what turns out to be that if you kind of zoom up these images, so I kind of, I kind of just zoom up this image again, I actually get this aliasing effect that I can see, for example, here in those, in those blacks area. And I'm actually losing um, those details. And the reason for that is that I've kind of ignored, I've thrown information in these intermediate pixel locations. Therefore, one typically takes, does an, an alternative approach, which says we want to scale that down, but we also want to take into account the pixel information from those other pixels. So I don't want to ignore the information which is stored in pixel 3.3. 3. So what would be a technique to do that? Technique you've seen already. So I, what I could do, for example, I could average over multiple pixels. And let's say simply average over nearby pixels and then takes this information into account. And what one typically does, one applies a smoothing filter on the original image and then performs the uh, transformation in terms of, which leads to the reduction of its size. So what we typically do is we apply, for example, a Gaussian filter. We can also use a box filter on the original image and then reduce its size. If we do this, we get those images here over here. So the G just means that it's we used um, a Gaussian kernel in order to smooth our image. So something we did in the chapter on convolutions. So applying this kind of the kernels, for example, the three by three kernels, um, um, and then either with the Gaussian kernel, we could also use a box filter over here to, to get the same effect. 
So if I now just kind of zoom into those images and, and put them over here, you can actually see that those effects we had before, so you can now go force and back. So this is the unsmoothed version, this is a smoothed version, and we have different aliasing effects. For example, you can also see this prominently here in this eye, where he can see the eye structure very well, Oops. and here you kind of get this um, effects from dropping certain uh, information that kind of these yellow pixels are kind of washed into this eye. And this is something which, so if I go forward and back all the time, you may see that here in that location. And therefore, one typically performs the smoothing before we reduce the size of our image. So again, to summarize this, why is the smoothing step needed, either with the box kernel or with the, with the Gaussian kernel, is that if we simply subsample an image and just kind of take a small subset of the intensity values at the original pixel locations, we lose information because we throw away a large number of different pixels. So if we reduce an image by a factor of two, that, and we don't do the smoothing, it basically means we throw away three quarter of the pixels that we had in our original image. If you completely throw that away, typically generate errors. And the better way for using this is to take the, to do a smoothing between neighboring pixels so that this information is not kind of lost and we, we don't get this um, aliasing um, artifacts that we have in our images. So whenever you need to scale down an image, you need to do a smoothing before. Or it is suggested to do that, let's say that way. So the next question is, um, how, sh how much should we smooth? And what are things on, uh, on which does the effect on how much I should smooth actually depend on? So what are quantities which should impact this question? Yeah? Well, it depends on how much I shrink the picture, that's true, or it kind of depends on the scale of the transformation. So if I scale this down um, dramatically, I would need a, a larger smoothing, a larger width of my kernel. On what could it depend as well? Then maybe what you see in the upcoming events, um, what the eye can measure maybe, because you can oversmooth it, maybe it notices or not. Okay, so, but this is something, so the effect on how we, what can I, which detail we can actually see with our eye um, I would rather say that is something which also depends on the scale. So if I, that would simply, if I would smooth too much, I would kind of average over pixel information, which just can be still perfectly separated in the output image. Um, of course, if you have very limited eyesight, um, then you may, you may have a different smoothing, um, but if you, let's say, we are, under the assumption that we are perfectly fine to identify the individual pixels with our eyes, um, this is something which I would also assign to the, 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 the thing of scale. Um, because so I should not smooth too much, that's what you were mentioning, and I shouldn't, but I should smooth sufficiently in order to do that. But it also depends on which kernel do I use. If I use the Gaussian kernel or I use a box kernel or some other kernel. So the kernel has an impact on that and also the size of that kernel. So do I take a 3x3 three three kernel or a 5x5 five five kernel or whatever, 21x21 21 21 kernel. Um, this is, depends directly on how much I should smooth. So these are kind of the, the three um, key quantities which, um, on which depends on how much should I smooth. So which kernel should I choose? So I need to choose a kernel. I need to choose a kernel size. And this should depend on the scale of the transformation. So let's go back and think what, about, what was about the width of the kernel. So how was that defined? It was typically defined using the standard deviation. That was also one of the equations you should have seen already in the chapter on um, convolutions. So the width of our kernel is given by the sum over the um, individual, so this is in 1D uh, pixel locations. I have the, 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 the value that I get from my kernel. Um, I sum all of the squared values up and it takes a square root. And we all, so if, if I apply that and use this for the, so put in the box kernel, so then G is a box kernel, or if G is the Gaussian kernel over here, I get different results. And these were kind of the two results that I have on how the, what's called the width of the kernel, so, or the standard deviation of the kernel, is impacted by the number of pixels of which I was smoothing. So if you 
think about the So if I, for example, think about a kernel where n equals 3, this would be this effect. Depending if I put a value of 1, 1, 1 in there, which would be the box kernel. So this is box. Or if I have 1, 2, 1, which was the Gaussian kernel, I get a different width of that kernel. So you kind of have that table over here. So in this case, for example, it would be for the Gaussian case 0 0.87 and for the other one uh, 0 0.82. Okay, so what we have here is kind of this n is kind of how large is my, my array or my template or my my kernel that I allocate for that and depending on which kernel I'm using I actually get a width output. So this is one of few of those examples for that. But the key thing on which this depends was actually the scale of the transformation. So we can define what is the scale of a transformation It's simply how much I scale up and down my image. If I have a very simple transformation like this one over here I kind of have a constant scale over the overall image because I'm kind of scaling the image exactly in the same way. If I go into more complex transformations, potentially nonlinear transformations, the scale may differ. So I may kind of compress the image in one area and kind of expand it in another area. So I kind of this information which is local and that we can actually compute what's called the scale for transformation by simply computing the first derivative of, this, of every dimension of this function, in our case x and y, with respect to x and y, and basically square those values and add them up. So in the end, having this formula over here. Again, if you have this simple transformation, these linear transformations, like this one over here, this will be the same value for every location. So then this, is, this m is not location dependent. But it could also be location dependent if you put nonlinear transformations in here. OK, so let's make an example. Assume we have this simple transformation over here, which is slightly different to the one which I've shown here, where both diagonal values, uh, diagonal elements have exactly the same value. This is different over here. So we have a different scale in the x direction, a different scale in the y direction. And we also kind of shift the image. So the shift does not impact the decision about the smoothing, which is kind of clear if I just shift an image, I don't need to do any smoothing. What I need to do, I need to compute for this part of the transformation, the first derivative um, of the first dimension with respect to x, with respect to y, and for the second dimension with respect to x and with respect to y. For such a linear function, it's actually quite easy. So if I take the x component and derive it with respect to x, I obtain 2 as my first derivative. So this value actually becomes 2 to the power of 2. If I derive the first line of this line over here with respect to, um, to y, I get a 0 because it doesn't depend on 0. If I derive the second uh, with respect to x, it's also 0. Therefore, we get my two zeros over here in computing the f first derivative of the second dimension of this function with respect to y. I obtain my 4 over here. So I can actually sum up those values and this scale, get a scale number typically of um, uh, uh, of, of three, of a bit more than three. Okay, this is a scale number, and um, then the question is, by how much should I actually smooth, or how much should I smooth? And this is something where the scale number typically needs to be taken into account. So depending on my transformation, I need to do the scaling in a way. And the larger the scale changes this, um, the more, or the, actually the smaller the scale is, the more smoothing that I need. So if I, for example, have an m which is around 1, do I need any smoothing? So if m, is, m takes values around 1, what does that mean? Uh, 
So I can actually, so it's true, I can basically ignore any smoothing because the scale stays more or less the same, so I'm typically not losing any information. What happens if the scale number m is larger than 1, substantially larger than 1? Exactly, so I need to fill gaps. I don't need to smooth at all. How do I fill gaps? Yeah, exactly, with the interpolation techniques that we discussed. So, bilinear interpolation or bicubic interpolation. What happens if m is smaller than 1? Then I typically exactly have the effect uh, that we discussed before, actually need smoothing. So this is just kind of very, very rough recommendation. So if, you, if your m is smaller than 1, but not really close to 0, typically if you have a width, a standard deviation of your kernel with 0.5, you're actually pretty good off in a lot of cases, unless you really small it, scale it down uh, to a very, very small number. If you're staying at m equals to 1 or roughly 1, this means you're basically at the same scale and sometimes you still need to interpolate because you may have a, a shift which is a slightly away from, those, uh, from the pixel location. In this case, bilinear interpolation typically does a pretty good job because you're often not too far away from a pixel location. But if you want a high quality image, but this needs more computation time, you may need to take into account the um, bicubic um, interpolation. And if m is larger than 1, or substantially larger than 1, basically you expand your image then you should take bicubic interpolation into account because you need to kind of fill more gaps, kind of generate more artificial pixels, and this upscaling typically should be, um, uh, should be considered, you, you should consider um, a more accurate interpolation technique which produces better results if you have larger gaps that you need to fill. What you can also do, or one of the applications where this is often used is if you build something which is called an image pyramid, which I think we very briefly discussed already, um, that means we start with our original image. For example, if this is the original image, we compute an image which is half of the size, a quarter of the size, an eighth of its size, and so on and so forth. We can actually store this information so whenever we need to have access to images at different scales, we can actually direct, directly use those elements of the image py pyramid. And we can also illustrate that, that this is the original image. This is image half of its size, a quarter of its size. You may s remember an image, in a, in an image which was very similar to that for the, um, in the matching chapter. We're looking for the cross-correlation technique. Where does this template match? So like the hierarchical search was using that, such an image pyramid. And here it's also important to take that into account that you actually need to do the smoothing as well if you build up this image pyramid in order to get high quality results. Kind of, it's kind of bringing up the image pyramid again, which we kind of very briefly discussed for the hierarchical search. So with the cross-correlation technique, I was kind of checking in which area does my template match best, and then I just look into this area which corresponds to the best match on the top level, and then I go down, I go down this pyramid. That means I only need to search in a, very, in a much smaller area. And the only thing I want to raise in here is that we, that we also need to do this smoothing technique if we um, generate this image pyramid. This is just an example of an image pyramid. So this is um, just one example image, in this case 500 by 500 pixels, making it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, just here kept at the same size so that you can better see it. Or okay, this is the size of the image pyramid, the original image, half of its size, a quarter of its size, and eight to 16, 32 and a 64th of the original size. So if you would use the cross-correlation technique for an hierarchical search, you would say, OK, in which area does my template fit well in this very small image? And then if you say, OK, it must be somewhere around this black thing here, which corresponds to the nose of the zebra, then you would refine the search in every area until you end up in the largest image. But you would not need to take this part of the image into account in your search, and therefore it's faster. The kind of the key message for today is in order to build up this image pyramid, you actually um, need to do also this, um, this smoothing from one image to the next image. So if you compute the next level of this pyramid. 
So in this, this one, I'm actually done for today with geometric transformations. So what we've done last in the last course was looking into what are geometric transformations. We mainly looked here into kind of this simple type of transformation, this linear transformations. But um, we also, uh, there are also much more complex ones or nonlinear ones, um, which are relevant, like for example, for morphing those faces. You would need a nonlinear one. Uh, what we discussed was kind of the resampling or ideas of using forward and inverse sampling. So how do I compute my output image? Do I start from the output image and look up in my input image or do it the other way around? You should always start from the output and then retrieve the corresponding information that you need for your computations from the input image. And then looked into the subsampling and um, smoothing technique you know, to build this image pyramid. That's it from my side with geometric transformation. Are there so far any further questions or any questions I can answer? So if this is not the case, just make a five minute break, let some fresh air in, and then look into a new chapter, looking into classification, which is something which we will discuss today, as well as on Thursday, um, on how to get kind of semantic information into our images. Thank you. <laughs>